tonsillectomies over the course of three years in Janesville, Wisconsin, from the same ENT at the same hospital. At each one of these times, I tried to find out what's this tonsillectomy going to cost. The Never same could ENT I get that answer at the same hospital. I only found out what it costs months after those procedures. Tom well, I got me get various cost. bills. Never could ENT I get that from the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor, from the anesthesiologist, from the hospital, and the variation of price between those three procedures from the same doctor and the same hospital within three years was huge. One of them, the recovery bill, the recovery for my son. He sat in a lazy boy, ate Jello, watched SpongeBob for two hours. That was fourteen hundred dollars. I mean, this is stuff is crazy. We don't shop like this for anything else we buy in our life. Why should we that shop like this for health care? And so what health savings accounts achieves, this is the law that I helped write in 2003, something that we as conservatives have been fighting for, for the whole time, is we want to increase health savings accounts, which is what we do in this bill, so we have more competition and lower costs. Here's the point I'm trying to make. In 2000, I got LASIK surgery. The reason I can see you all so well is because in 2000, I got this LASIK surgery, which was elective. Insurance didn't cover it. And so I knew exactly what the procedure was going to cost up front. And since then, this eczema laser that does this procedure has been revolutionized three times, and the price is lower. So in this area of healthcare, quality went up and costs went down because I cared as a consumer what it was. So it's not that that dynamic cannot happen in healthcare, it's that it isn't happening throughout most of healthcare. And what health savings accounts does is it helps hardworking taxpayers get access to affordable solutions to help them pay for their out-of-pocket costs, but it's also their skin in the game, their money. If they save money by saying to a hospital or a doctor or a healthcare provider, what is this going to cost me? Where's the best value for my money? If we can bring that consumer pressure to bear in healthcare, we can dramatically enlist the support of millions of Americans to help us fix this healthcare problem. And that's one of the critical things we're trying to achieve here. Instead of using OPM, other people's money, to pay for health care that you don't care what things cost, we want to harness the power of the marketplace, the power of the consumer, of the patient and the doctor to demand better services, to demand better quality. We want transparency on price, on quality, and an economic incentive to act on that thing so that we can bring consumers to the bear. This is what we say, this is what we mean when we say we want a patient health care system. Okay, here is a really important part of our American Health Care Act, refundable tax credits. I want to explain exactly what we mean when we say this. Under the current Obamacare system, we have a Washington-controlled system with skyrocketing premiums and dwindling choices. It's a death spiral. It's collapsing. Government makes you buy what you want to buy, and it's an open-ended subsidy for a lot of Americans. Our solution is a portable monthly tax credit. This is why we believe this is the right way to go. We want a market-based system which will give us lower costs, more competition, and more choices. There's a real problem in the tax code today in that the tax code discriminates against people who don't get health care from their job. If you're working and you're not on Medicaid and you have a job that's paying you 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour and that job does not give you health insurance, there's nothing that the tax code does to help you buy health insurance. If you do have health care from your job, you have an open-ended tax benefit. So what we're saying is that's really kind of not fair to the, to the man or woman who's working at a job that doesn't get health insurance offered to them. Let's equalize the tax treatment of health care and give people the same kind of tax benefit to go buy health insurance if they don't get it from their job. And giving a person a monthly of, of portable tax credit gives them the ability up front to go buy health insurance of their choosing. And here's the key. You buy what you want to buy. If you don't want to use your tax credit to go buy health insurance, you don't have to. If you don't want to buy this plan, you want to buy that plan, go for it. It's your choice. It's freedom. It's called free market health care. The states get to set up their own health insurance systems. The states get to set up their own regulations so that you can buy whatever you want to buy where you live. That is called patient's choice. That is called a patient-centered system. And that is one of the biggest tools we believe can be used to replace Obamacare. This is part of replacing Obamacare with a system that works to give everybody universal access to affordable coverage. Now, here is where we stand. The current system is riddled with endless regulations that are driving up costs and limiting choices for consumers, and you see how the collapse is occurring. Our solution 
greater consumer options. The patient is the nucleus of the healthcare system. We don't want insurance companies becoming monopolies looking for favoritism in a cronyistic way at Washington. We want health insurers, hospitals, doctors, all providers of health care benefits competing against each other for our business as consumers. That is how the great American free enterprise system works in all other aspects of our lives and our economy. That's what should work in this system as well. So the result, you choose the plan that meets your needs. You buy what you want to buy, not what the government tells you to buy. So our goal here is final as this. Lower costs, more choices, patients in control, universal access to care. Um, there are two points I would make in conclusion. We as Republicans have been waiting seven years to do this. We as Republicans who fought the creation of this law and accurately predicted that it would not work, ran for office in 2010, in 2012, in 2014 and in 2016 on a promise that we would, if given the ability, we would repeal and replace this law. How many people running for Congress and the Senate did you hear say that? How many times did you hear President Donald Trump, when he was candidate Donald Trump, say that? This is the closest we will ever get to repealing and replacing Obamacare. The time is here, the time is now, this is the moment, and this is the closest this will ever happen. It really comes down to a binary choice. We now have the ability, through the budget rules that we have in the Senate, with our three-pronged approach, to actually make good on our word. We told people in 2016 what it would look like when we had the chance to replace Obamacare. That was our better way plan. That's what this is. So we said in 2016 to our citizens, to the American people, to our constituents, if you give us this chance, this opportunity, this is what we'll do. Now is our chance and our opportunity to do it. Questions? Chad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You say this is a binary choice. Uh, Two-part question here. Why would somebody not believe this is take it or leave it when you hear from members of the Freedom Caucus that conservatives say take your bill or, or change it? And number two, when the uh, Democrats approved cap and trade in the summer of 2009, there was much criticism of a manager's amendment, which was put in at the end, to, to make that bill right for passage on the floor. When we hear these criticisms from Republicans, why would we expect something like that not to emerge in this case to make that bill okay uh, to pass and get their votes? So I, I would answer it in this way. Uh, what people are talking about, and there's a lot of frustration, a lot of confusion, frankly, out there. Um, among conservative groups and, and even among members is reconciliation has certain limits. So there are folks who would love to see us put in this reconciliation bill all these other ideas. One conservative group is saying, by golly, you better put uh, shopping across state lines in this bill or else we're not going to support it. Guess what, Chad? If we did that, we wouldn't be able to pass this bill. It would be filibustered in the Senate. It wouldn't even come up for a vote. So the last thing we want to do is prevent our ability to actually get law made. So it really is a conversation about the third prong approach. The other bills we're going to pass outside of reconciliation, which in the House we're a majority body, we can pass, that go to the Senate. So much of the conversations are about moving this other agenda on the same track uh, around the same time to get these things done. The, the last point is, as you know the process, but a lot of people don't, we're going through four different committees. That's how legislation works through regular order. We just did the Ways and Means Committee last night. We're in the middle of the Commerce Committee. Next week it goes to the Budget Committee, and then it goes to the Rules Committee before it goes to the House floor. The bill will be out there for three weeks to be looked at. Go to readthebill.gop. It's a 123-page bill. It's not 2,000 pages of something that they just whipped together and flipped to the floor like they did. They didn't, we didn't write it in Harry Reid's office on Christmas Eve. This was written by our committees. And let's back up a second even further. This bill has been worked on for a year. This bill was worked on from January to June last year so that we could offer our constituents and the American people in our Better Way agenda what we would replace Obamacare with. We offered it up in June. We ran on it all through the election. And now we've translated it into legislation. And even backing up further, these two key components, block granting Medicaid back to the states, defederalizing an entitlement, putting a cap on it, 
That is something that conservatives have been talking about and dreaming about for decades. In repealing another entitlement, Obamacare, its mandates, its subsidies, its taxes, and replacing it with Republican free market health care tax policy? If you told me two, ten years ago this was where we would be, I'd, I'd think I'd be in a dream. I'd be doing backflips. To conservatives who've been fighting for health care reform, this is so exciting. And so what's happening now is members realize this is the chance, this is the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So naturally in the legislative process, people are saying, well, I'd love to have this in there. I'd love to have that in there. That's the legislative process. That's what we're going through. And what people are sort of learning is this reconciliation tool is pretty tight. There's a lot of stuff we would love to put in the bill, but unfortunately the Senate rules don't allow us to do that. And that's where you see a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, understandably so, but that's also why we have a three-pronged approach. Administrative actions by Tom Price at HHS and the additional legislation that we're going to move as well. So just to clarify, not to belabor the point, so you're saying that this bill was crafted in a way that would meet the reconciliation bird test in the Senate. Correct. Ergo, there couldn't be much change to this and you have the other options. Yeah, so, 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 not, so not many changes. Well, we'll see, we'll see what, what, what we have to do when, when you get our score, because as you know, you don't, when you go to authorizing committees, you typically don't go with your score ready. When we get our score, I'm sure we'll probably have to make some tweaks and adjustments. That happens every time we do reconciliation. But yes, this is written, this bill is written so that it's called privileged. This bill is written so that it can't be filibustered, so that they have to bring it up and vote on it in the Senate. And if we put things in this bill that take that privilege off of it so that it's not reconciliation, they won't even vote on it. They will filibuster it and they won't even vote on it. So that's what I mean when I say this is the closest we've been to a repealing and replacing Obamacare. And let me just say it again. This is the closest we will ever get to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, how did you come up with the amount that you would give out in tax credits, and why should a family that makes $140,000 a year get the same amount as a family that makes $40,000? It's a really good question. So uh, the amount of the tax credits is based upon um, the way insurance works. And it's modeled after the Tom Price legislation, um, which he had last year, which is adjust for age and family size. Because the older a person gets, the more costly their health care is. That's how insurance is written. So the tax credit adjusts more tax credit for the person's age. And obviously, if you have a bigger family, you have more health care costs, so a bigger tax credit. Now, why is the crap set where it is? And that's something, by the way, uh, 12 members of the Freedom Caucus, for example, were co-sponsors of the Price legislation just last December, which is this kind of a tax credit situation. A lot of our members, through our feedback, we had seven member listening sessions in February, uh, four uh, conferences, getting feedback from our members on this draft of this legislation, getting their ideas, and one of the, the concerns was we should cap this credit, so like a millionaire that doesn't get health care from their work, but as a millionaire doesn't get a tax credit. So that was something that everybody agreed with, and the Ways and Means Committee made that adjustment. But the reason it's set where it is is we don't want to have a job penalty. Go back a few years ago, and when CBO said Obamacare produces job lock, Obamacare says that the equivalent of 2 to 3 million people will not go into the workforce, will not take jobs because of the way the Obamacare subsidies work. What I mean when I say that is if you set that credit limit too low and a person loses their credit, by getting a raise or, or, or advancing in life, you don't want to dis, disincentivize that. So they're set at such a level that that wouldn't occur. Or they're set at such a level so that it really is for a middle income family or even an upper middle income family so that we never tell a person, don't take that raise, don't get that job, don't take that promotion. We don't want federal tax law or tax credits to ever encourage a person not to advance, not to take a job, not to, to get a raise. That's why. Where does the $2,000 $2, figure come from? Let me, let me go in the back. Uh, Kayla Tausche, CNBC. You'll need companies on board to provide the optionality that you're talking about. And almost every industry organization has come out against this. The reason why there isn't as much participation as customers might like is because these companies can't offer these products and still make money. Yeah. How do you get buy-in from a, the business community? It's a great example. Here's what people are not seeing, which is number two. Uh, Tom Price for legal reasons, can't tell you what he's thinking about doing. There's, there's, there's laws that prevent that. We can do so much deregulation through the executive branch by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He actually just put one regulation out the other day 
which will go a long way toward lowering the cost of health insurance. So they haven't even seen yet what our secretary at HHS can do in, in number two, in, in, in phase two here, where they actually can dramatically lower the price of health insurance. So those companies haven't seen that yet. So there are no concessions. So let me just finish. Let me, don't, don't interrupt if you don't mind. Um, here's the other point. We have basically a few options in front of us. Number one, do nothing. Let the system collapse. What the insurers are telling us is, if you thought a 25% average premium increase was rough in 2017, it's going to be a whole lot more of, than that in 2018, and more and more insurers are going to pull out. So the insurers are telling us, if we don't know what's going on come late spring, we're going to have massive premium increases and pullouts, and you'll collapse the individual market. What they also tell us, though, is if you only repeal the law, just gut and repeal the law, as some folks are suggesting, then you'll have triple-digit premium increases, and you'll collapse the individual market. You've got to remember... If we just repeal Obamacare, it's not like life in the world goes back to life before Obamacare. Obamacare did so much damage to the U.S. health insurance system that it's not as if you can just go back to the day before. <coughs> so that's why we are offering a better way. That's why we're offering the American Health Care Act. That's why we're offering a system that brings choice and competition back into the marketplace, gives people to the use of risk pools, health savings accounts, and tax credits the ability to go find affordable coverage, and that brings insurers back into the marketplace. The insurers are telling us that will bring insurers back into the marketplace. If they can actually offer the plans that people want to buy, not the plans that people are making them buy, they'll have more plans being offered. There'll be more choice and more competition. That is what brings down costs. And in conjunction with all the administrative things that Tom Price can do, those efforts together can help dramatically save our system and give us low-cost health insurance, better quality health insurance, and access to affordable health insurance. Don't forget how all this works together. Subsidize the sick and the pre-existing condition through risk pools and reinsurance. Health savings accounts to bring the consumer in the marketplace to put pressure on providers to compete for our business based on cost and quality. And then give families who have jobs but don't have the kind of jobs that gives them health insurance benefits the same kind of tax benefit everybody else gets. So they, too, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the month, can go buy a plan that best meets their needs. That is how you fix and save the system from the crash that it is, it is occurring, and we're very, very confident that will work that way. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you for uh, putting up with my town hall presentation. I just think it's really important to try and iron out all the differences, to show that there's folks who say, gosh, you should have this and that in this bill. Reconciliation doesn't let you do it. We're doing it here. People who say, well, these regulations are so expensive and so costly, Tom Price at HHS can fix those things. We can fix this problem. We promised the American people we would fix this problem. And the way to fix this problem is to repeal Obamacare and replace it with a patient-centered, market-based system. This is something that we as conservatives have been dreaming about for decades. This is the chance and the best and only chance we're going to get. And that's why I'm really excited. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Would you Speaker. be willing to sit Speaker. down off camera with some healthcare journalists to discuss this? Yeah. <laughs>